Can everybody hear me? Yeah, cool. So my name's Sunil. People call me Sunny for simplicity. And I'm here to talk about that. Uh, it's a long title. But bear with me. I know you all must all be sleepy after you know, lunch, two talks, whatever. But just bear with me, please. Please. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers, Diana, Sabine, Engen, and Maxim for doing this. And I'm extremely thankful for the um, call for proposals system. Because if not for that, I probably wouldn't be here. And thank you all who voted for my talk for whatever reason. I hope I will not disappoint you. Uh, uh, I work at a small SF startup called Hey.co, where you can go to the website, whatever. Uh, and before that, I led an iOS team for two years in Moscow. Uh, I suck at social things, so you know, please come up to me and talk about whatever afterwards. So this is my favorite slide from Apple's presentations. Uh, it's kind of relevant here because this talk is going to be both soft and hard because there's going to be live coding. Chris stole that idea from me, I'm sure. And everything might crash and burn, so it should be pretty entertaining. So a quick outline. First, I'll be talking about prototyping and just the concepts around it, so that's the soft part. Then I'll show the nifty thing I was working on, and that's where the demo part is going to be. And afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about open source. I know Ash talked a lot about that. So I'll just tell you my experience uh, participating in this project. So prototyping. Uh, it's when you quickly throw something together that later gets shipped into a production app, right? Well, no. It's building an incomplete representation of a possible future part of your product to evaluate ideas. And it should be cheaper than building the real thing, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. It should be faster to modify and try out you know, little tweaks and ideas. And software prototypes usually provide like a hidden gesture or whatever, where you have these sliders and toggles and whatnot uh, to change the live running app. And what I like the most about the prototypes that I worked on was that I could always keep this idea in my head that they're throwaway, that you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just it has to be there for me to test out my ideas. It's like working with paper. It's you know, putting a part of my brain into something else so I can work with it. So what is it useful for? Um, anything, really. Uh, engineering, the real kind, not our kind. So mechanical, electrical, electronics, aviation, whatever. This is actually a um, roller bearing that was fabricated using a rapid prototyping process. And it's, you know, it, it works. But you didn't have to you know, melt the steel and create it, but it, you can still play with it and see how the real thing will, will work. Product design. So this photo shows a few variations of the Flip Mini video camera. So you can see the, um, the body of the camera evolving, and the designers could you know, hold it in their hands, put it in the pocket, see how it feels. And of course, software. So how many of you have ever built something that you would call a prototype? Yay, so everybody knows what I'm talking about. I can just shut up. Uh, yeah, you probably use these technologies or maybe something else. Uh, but for now, let me talk about something a little bit different. Alternative mediums and materials. If you're doing exploratory research or you know, inventing a new design or something, it's very important to think outside the box, whatever that means. And one way to get your you know, head juices flowing is taking a step back from what you usually work with and trying out di different material, a different you know, building block. So this, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about this. It's a um, healthy made. It's an imaginary product. It's created as part of a, I think, human design course led by Acumen and Idea. And they tried to answer the question, how might we provide healthier food options for people in need? So they tried building this, fresh ingredients and recipes packaged together in a healthy meal. And they tried to keep the price to $10. I mean, it's, you know, it's an imaginary product, but it still proves my point. So in these photos, you can see some of the prototypes that they've built. You know, it's cardboard, paper, just printed stuff. And there's a can of whatever there. Uh, this is another thing they tried. So these materials, they allowed them to build a high fidelity prototype out of very low fidelity materials. I mean, most of these things, you'll just have them in your home. And yet, they could you know, hold them in their hands. They could feel them. They could try out different arrangements. 
in a much, and, and the results were much more real than if they were doing them on a computer. So this is the final prototype that they came up with. You can see that the, the recipe is right there in your face. You can see the, the products there. It's all laid out neatly. So I think this approach of using alternative materials also applies to software, especially with something as tactile as touch UI. Of course, flat UI is all the rage right now, but still the layering of, uh, of your software and the, the hierarchy of the, of the layers is still extremely important. And I, uh, despite the fact that the actual representations that we draw on the screen are increasingly disconnected from real things, it's still best when the interactions and the animations and the movements are grounded in reality. So I'd like to commend Google's material design here, because they've, you know, they've formulated a huge document of guidelines based around these principles, which I feel like Apple should do more. I mean, there, we have the, the HIG, but this just felt more coherent. So paper is really a decent tool for creating these low-fidelity, cheap prototypes that you can just play with, get a feel for them, and throw them away. And by handling them with your hands, you can get a better feel of the relationships between the, ob the objects that you're trying to build, you know, compared to just throwing something up in Photoshop or, or HTML and CSS. Play-Doh is another alternative material that you, you could use to, to do that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you might be thinking, well, come on, this doesn't have any relationship whatsoever to you know, the black rectangular devices that we handle. Well, Mei Li, you should follow her on Twitter. She currently leads mobile design in Khan Academy. Before that, she worked for a few years at Apple in the human device prototyping group. I think it was four or five years, I'm not sure. Uh, so this series of tweets caught my eye. I'm not sure if you can read it. She says that her helping with the future got started with Play-Doh. She, that she was hooking up sensors and Play-Doh. Can anyone take a guess what technology she was talking about here? Just shout it. Anyone? All right. Force touch and Taptic Engine. They also talked about a gigantic arcade button, so I think that, that related to the, the, you know, the, the feel that the Taptic Engine in Apple Watch gives you back. So she's credited as the co-inventor on a number of patents related to those technologies, so you should definitely follow her. Um, so yeah, these alternative materials, they are really great for inducing creativity. Once again, you can hold them, manipulate them, feel them, and what's very important is getting instant feedback. We're not yet at a point where you can have a digital medium that you can manipulate like this. I mean, we've, we've seen the the HoloLens demos, which, which kind of want to show you that that's going to be possible. And uh, if you follow Brett Victor, he was talking about this you know, abstract future material where you can work with digital things with your hands. But right now, at this moment, we can still try and achieve that instant feedback quality using the tools that we have. And the shorter we can make the, the time for you know, an idea in your head to seeing the result of that change, the easier it will be to maintain you know, your, your creative momentum, your, your thoughts. So some disclosure, maybe when you looked at the title, you were thinking about prototyping like apps as in uh, this screen you know, connects to this screen and then connects to that screen. I'm not going to talk about that. I'll be talking about prototyping touch interactions, not applications. But I will be talking about touch devices. So here be dragons. It's a very early project. And I haven't started it. It's called Prototype, Prototope, and it was started and built by the good folks at Khan Academy. And I'm just a random dude that somehow managed to contribute to that. But I don't work there. Uh, it's implemented in Swift, but it doesn't really matter what it's implemented with. It's just it was, a, I guess, a random decision at that point. I mean, Khan Academy, they're building their main app in Swift. And they're having some trouble because of that decision, but they're still you know, powering through with the hope that it's going to get better soon. Uh, it's built on top of UIKit. It abstracts some of the weirdness that UIKit brings with it, so it's a bit easier to comprehend without you know, getting into the details of how UIKit works underneath. And there's much less boilerplate 
uh, it comes bundled with Facebook's pop animation engine. And the really cool thing is that it's bridged JavaScript, and this is a big deal. You, you, know, you might have whatever thoughts you have about JavaScript, but it's very important to, to, to this particular approach. Uh, it would have been much less painful <laughs> to implement this in Objective-C because of the fact that it's bridged with JavaScript. The JavaScript core framework, you know, it wasn't designed for Swift. It was designed for Objective-C. So it's, there was a lot of busy work involved with, with bridging that. Andy Matushak described the, state, the current state of uh, you know, prototyping tools in these two tweets. Uh, the main point is that the current tools, some of them uh, have trouble with so people, when pe people are using this, uh, they have trouble implementing simple things. And then if the tool allows them to implement simple things easily, it's hard to implement complex things. And even when that balance is perfect, it's still hard to get a real feel from that prototype that you would get from a final product if it was implemented on a native platform. So here are the goals that were set for Prototype. Uh, to make simple easy, to make complex possible, um, the produced prototype should be easily mapped to the production. So it, it's not about you know, copying code and pasting it in the final thing. It's about working with the same values, same mechanisms. So the behavior that you get from your prototype is at least very near to the, what the real thing is going to be like. And I think the most important point is it should support rapid iteration. So how is it right now? I mean, I described it in terms of you know, black squares and draggable black squares and a springy draggable black square, but you'll just see it in the demo. It also makes complex possible because it's essentially just code. That's a simplified version of UIKit that's easier to play with. And right now, uh, there are some problems with the performance, but it's you know, it's going to get better. It's, as I said, it's still a very early product. Uh, rapid iteration. A scene in Prototope is just a JavaScript file. It can be loaded dynamically on the device, which means that it can be sent over the network, which means that it can be reloaded at any point, like on every edit. I'm sure the folks from React Native know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so, demo. I, Hope I can switch over to the other screen. Come on, help. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure. Deck. Can you help me switch over to the mirror mode? As always, live demos are really uh, exciting. As I said, it's very exciting, yeah. Because <laughs> everything usually crashes and burns when you try to do a demo. Yeah, nothing is working. Nothing is working. Let's kill Finder. It's actually also nope. pretty cool that the uh, um, projector here is from the 90s. I guess it's it. really huge resolution, so it's really hard to actually nope. <laughs> see the stuff uh. on the small monitors. As you can actually see here, right? <laughs> All right, so I think I'm... So I can, drag, I, I can drag my stuff into here, right? What I want people to see. Yay. But then I won't be able to see it. But just, just go to this. Okay, mirror. Yep. Okay, got it. Wonderful. Cool. All, All right. right, we're back. So, demo time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll try to do this. Right, so I'm starting out with an empty JavaScript file. Uh, this is the simulator. I tried to make it work with an iPad, but as soon as people came back from lunch, the, you guys flooded the Wi-Fi, so it was completely dead. Uh, so this is a little app called Protocaster. 
it loads the scene from you know, your laptop or your desktop, and it's going to send it over to the device which is currently running on the laptop. But this should work in a normal environment with a real iPad. So let's start. Uh, I promised you a black square on the screen. So here are the necessary lines. We just create a layer. We specify the position. And we change the background color to be black. Yay! We have a black square on the screen. But that's not interesting. I can change the color to red. Change it to red. I didn't have to you know, reload anything. This, this, this whole thing does it by itself. But that's still not really interesting, because it's just a black square. Let's try moving it around. So this is just three lines, including a line with a uh, closing bracket. And I can already drag it around. A few more lines. I should be able to drag it around, and it comes back you know, to its normal position. But this isn't really helpful you know, when you're trying to prototype something. Uh, but this should be. So these lines specify tunable parameters. Their name, you know, and the default value. And if I double tap with two fingers, triple tap with two fingers, I get this thing. So I can change the parameters of the spring on the go. I can make it you know, resolve faster or slower. My bad. I left helpful comments, and I'm not listening to them here. This should be here. So yeah, I can make it resolve faster or slower. Right? I can you know, make it less bouncy or more bouncy. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's still just a black or red square. We should make it more fun. This is just you know, JavaScript. This is actually TypeScript, and we pre-process the file. That's why it's taking a, you know, a bit of time to reload. Cat. And it's a cat. It's actually a Nyan cat. You know. And it all still works. Now let's do something even more interesting. Uh, this thing is called a heartbeat. It basically calls a function on every frame or every, you know, however often I want. It, it's underneath. It's a CA display link, so this should all be familiar. And you know, I made my cat scale up and down, and I can actually control the increment with the tunable spec. So I can make it do this faster or slower. Please come on. Or I can make it stop. Now. Let's make it meow. So this function creates a new sound uh, from a random choice of cat sounds. I'm not going to. It's basically an array of, you know, names of files, and it plays that sound. So I can call this as soon as I pick up the cat. There, and the cat went away. There it is. <laughs> right? <laughs> we can do some more, some more cool stuff with this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we can make it talk. I know cats don't usually talk, but this one's a special cat. So instead of the meow function, I'm going to call the speak function. I'm sorry, I'm lost in my own code. Speak. You are my friend. Please, don't hurt me. Kyle told me that there would be cake. That hurt. Uh, this is, you know, this is nothing special. It's just calling uh, one of the standard APIs that, you know, you can use to uh, 
read text, but it's very simple to use here. You just you know, specify the text you want it to say, and you call speech.say. You know, there's no import, blah, blah, blah. There's no you know, setup. It's just it's very fast to use. Now we can do some more things uh, with this little thing. So every single one of those classes needed a lot of code to bridge from uh, Swift to JavaScript and back. But it was worth it, because you can do this. I think it's black square. Whoops, outburst emitter, black square. My cat's called the black square. You are my friend. I'm sorry. Right, you can see the, the little flames there. I'm going to turn off the sound for Please, now. Please, don't hurt me. Oh. As soon as I reload the, the project, I, I'm not sure if you can see it, but basically this, as soon as I run that line of code, it starts a particle emitter. Once again, I'm using it for something useless, but a designer who's working with, you know, who's trying to invent a new way of teaching kids math will use it for something much better than this. All right, so that's it for the current demos. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the presentation. Yay. That's it. Whoops. <laughs> right. But what about real usage? It's a great question. Uh, it's right now at Khan Academy, I mean, this was built specifically for that project. It's used in the early math project. Uh, they're trying to invent new interactions for kids to learn math. They're based somewhat on the constructivist theory, which says that children, young children, invent their own they, they, they invent their own understanding of math. They construct their own understanding. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to find some tools that are interesting enough for the kids to you know, play with and use. And as a result of that, they'll construct their own understanding of math you know, without us teaching them high abstract concepts. Uh, but what do I have to do with it? This brings me to the last section of the talk, participating in open source. Coming back to Ash's talk, uh, he talked about being open source by default. And this project was open source from the start. And I follow Andy on GitHub. <laughs> so I just noticed that he open sourced something new. I cloned it. I built it on my machine. And I noticed that something was missing. I think it was the, the scale gesture recognizer. So the bridge for that. Uh, the, the representation for that in the prototype was missing. And I just, you know, I implemented it, played with it. I was like, all right, I'll just submit a PR. Maybe someone will merge it. And after a few minor comments and edits, it was. And I continued doing that. I continued bridging some of the APIs. I continued interacting with them on GitHub. And, you know, when they had time, they would respond to my, you know, comments, issues. But why would I want to work on something that's essentially an internal project in another company? And it was in a very rough state. The JavaScript bridge wasn't there. That was built by Andy later. You know, it was just, for me, it was just a fun project. And writing Swift is fun. And I love prototyping. So I just did it. It was, for me, it was a way to do some good in the world at a point where I was, you know, kind of doubting that I was doing something useful <laughs> at work. Uh, you know, I was doing some good vicariously through those people who were then later working with Prototype and building something real. And it was a chance to interact with some very, very smart people. Jason Brannan, Andy Matushak, Meiliko, uh, Marcos Oyedo, basically every, every, you can look at the project on GitHub that I'm going to have a link later and just, you know, see who works on it. So my advice to you as to how to participate in open source if you have a project that you like, use, or find interesting, you know, just spend some time looking at the issues. You know, don't be daunted if there's like 100 open issues. Some of them might be outdated. They just you know, didn't bother to go through the list and filter out the old ones. People still 
care. People still read that stuff. And if you find a missing bit, and you open an issue for it, and you implement it yourself, that's great. <laughs> People are going to love you for this. And if you're learning something new, you are, you know, you're probably reading through the documentation as you learn the project. So just what Ash said, uh, it's it's a very it's usually a very weak point in open source projects, right? Uh, documentation. It's it gets outdated very easily, and you don't really come back to it once you you know once you know it. And contributions are very very welcome. So Prototope has some pretty bad holes in user friendliness at the moment, but that's expected. It's an internal project. If you want, if you're interested, you can contribute or not. You can contribute to your favorite project. I think everybody should join like a discussion group or whatever for the, for the projects that they're interested in. So IRC, Slack is very popular, but you know the channels kind of the, the teams kind of get out of hand. Mailing lists are very useful, and it's obvious when I say it, but. <laughs> You'll be able to learn from the veterans, and you'll also be able to help out the newbies. And that's, you know, it's, it's great. It's what the community is built on. Now, some takeaways. Uh, if there is a contributing MD, read it. It's not that hard. And it will give you some hints as to how best you can contribute to that project. Uh, as I told you for Prototype, I didn't expect them to merge my contribution. Because just because a project is open source doesn't mean that you know, they're, they're maintaining it. But it still doesn't hurt to try, especially if you've already done the work. It's very likely that if you submit a PR, it will get merged. Uh, when you are working with a team, I think you should over-communicate. So if you're planning to spend some time working on something, just say it. Just say, I'm going to work on this bit. And other people will see that, and probably you will not end up working on the same thing concurrently. Coming back to the point about working with very smart people, I loved you know, getting code review for, for the prototype stuff. Even though the code is, is like very menial, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not really interesting code. It's, the prototype is an interesting product, and what you build with it is, is very interesting. But still, it was a great you know, teaching opportunity and learning opportunity for me. This was one of the best things about the whole experience. And most importantly, don't beat yourself up. So if you cannot find free time to contribute at the moment, don't worry. Maybe you'll find it later. If you started working on a PR or an issue and you know, life gets in the way, just let others know. And someone might pick it up for you, someone might not. It, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. And if you stress out about work, and then if you end up stressing out about open source stuff, that's just too much for one person to handle. You know, we have enough burnout to deal with already. So to make sure that everybody has a great time, try to keep your feedback constructive. I mean, everybody talks about being kind right now, right? It's very easy to accidentally say something that's actually pretty hurtful. So that sentiment analysis text box that you know, was talked about in the, in the first talk is a pretty great idea. It would be really useful to have that in you know, the GitHub uh, common box, every common box on the internet, actually. If someone does end up saying something hurtful to you, maybe saying something hurtful about your code, don't take it personally. You are not your code, as Ash said. And you know, respect the other contributors, respect their time, respect their effort, respect the fact that this is likely something that they're doing you know, after work. We should all respect each other. I mean, this is already a very friendly community, but we can always do better. So do I have some more time to show some demos? Right, because I was no. showing you some crappy stuff that I've built, but let me show you the real things that uh, folks at Khan Academy actually worked on. Uh, once again, all that is open source. You can, uh, I'll have the link up later. Um, so this was my demo and early math. Example of counting by touch count. Do I have sound on? One, 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 one. No. 
Sound, please. Two, two, two. Okay. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's fine. One, one, two. Okay. Two. Right. So this is an example of one of the prototypes that they've built. Uh, one. On the simulator, I can only put down like two simulated one, fingers. Two. But the actual iPad can take up to I think eleven fingers. So every time you put, touch one, down two, two. on the screen, it you know it shows a pretty animation. Two. It shows a pretty circle. It Say, says the number out loud. Once again, this, I think this was pretty fast to build. And this, this was one of the first examples that I, that I saw. But this one's more interesting. Sorry. Oops. I want to be singing through touch. So it's a very similar demo, but. One, two. And it goes up and up and up. So it. On the device itself, it's much more fun to play with, with this prototype than the other one. And this framework allows you to change what, you've, what you're working on really easily you know, without having to, to go through the trouble of recompiling, without having to work with the UI kit. And yet, you're, you're still building on the same native uh, mechanisms, right? So you're still using gesture recognizers just in a slightly friendlier API. Uh, one interesting thing, in the gesture recognizers, in the handler, we're exposing the sequence of all the touches from the beginning, right? So you don't have to s store your initial position anywhere. You can just, at every callback of the gesture recognizers handler, you can pick up the, the whole sequence. You can average the values. You can calculate the velocity right from there. You, you know, it's much less stuff to deal with. And because it's JavaScript, uh, the designers that usually work with like creative coding stuff and processing JS, they already know it, so it's much easier for them to pick this up and working uh, with the UI kit. So this demo, you know, you have little squares on the screen and you can draw shapes around them, and it will come them for you and you know light light up with different colors. Whoops. So this whole repository is full of things like this. It's, it's actually interesting. I mean, I, I don't have much insight into the process that goes on in, uh, inside Khan Academy, right? But it's still, I can see the artifacts, and I, uh, I can guess some of the things. Uh, so these three demos are actually interesting. This is a you know, block of, what, eight squares? And they've built three ways to decompose this, this little bar into separate objects. So this demo shows you how to pinch them out, right? And this, with, the, with this tool, you could teach the kids, oh, you know, this thing is composed of you know, eight something. And then you can split it, and how many things is here, and how many things is here. Uh, so they're trying out different ideas, and they have a lab school where they can go in and test them out really quickly with you know, children who are learning math. So this is slice to decompose. You can slice through the thing, join it back, slice here. And one more thing. You can drag this like drag the scissors through the block to split it. This demo feels really nice on the iPad. I'm not sure how how well you can see what was going on. You can draw a rectangle, right, and you can have different colors. And they show how many squares they're taking up. So you can you know compare sizes, compare shapes, you can it's very fun to play around with. I mean, I, I spent like, I don't know, 10 minutes just, just, just doing this. So I'm, I'm sure the kids love that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's it. I'm not going to bore you with more demos. Um, thank you.